So I want this one over there too. Okay. But we'll do it over here first. So uh, we've talked about object-oriented programming in the context of encapsulation and abstraction. Uh, what I want to do now is look at it from the perspective of inheritance. Uh, now, inheritance, you, you, uh, the, the, the reason that this comes in is because you, you've already seen code reuse and the value of code reuse. If you've got a chunk of code that you see yourself using over and over and again, what's, what do you do? You take that chunk of code, you put it into a function, and you reuse the function. Well, in the context of objects, how do you have, okay, I've got an object that has a certain piece of functionality or state or whatever. How do I reuse that when I've got a slightly different concept over here? And that's where inheritance comes in. Inheritance is a mechanism in object-oriented programming uh, by which objects can be extended, uh, extended uh, to one, inherit, that's why we call it inheritance, inherit state and behavior from a superclass. So we've got this concept of superclasses and subclasses below them inheriting from their parents, also called parent classes and child classes. And or uh, override or augment, augment uh, state and behavior to provide more specific functionality. Right? And again, the reasons that you would want to do this is it provides provides a way to reuse code. If you uh, inherit something and then slightly change it, that means that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can uh, inherit all that uh, that behavior and that state, and uh, and you don't have to just create a brand new ar uh, object with cut and paste kind of stuff. And it provides a way to organize code. Right? Reuse and organization. Now, organization here, it, uh, it comes into play because it basically defines a hierarchy. Uh, so here's one example. This is a simplified example of the Java Collections library. Way up here, we have a very general concept of a collection. A collection is simply just a box that holds stuff. That's as abstract as it gets. It's, it's, it just holds stuff. Right? How does it hold stuff? Well, for that, we need to define subclasses. A set holds stuff in an unordered manner, whereas a list holds stuff in an ordered manner. With a list, there's a concept of the first element, the second element, the third element. You can get the ith element, right? It's ordered. With a set, you don't have that method get uh, by index because there are no indexing. It's unordered, right? Uh, you can further uh, provide more specificity. Uh, for example, let's just focus here on the list. There are two ways that you can, in the Java uh, collections library, that you can implement a list. One of them is an array-based list, array list, and one of them is a linked list. Right? So an array list holds stuff with an array inside of it. Right? So there's an array, and it puts stuff in, and, and so there, there's an array. And if you ever need to fill it up, then you need to dy dynamically expand it. If it's ever, you know, uh, you, you can also shrink it. We'll look at that later on. A linked list defines these nodes. Here's a node that holds one element. It points to another node that holds another element. It points to the next node. It's all linked together in these chains. So from that perspective, an array list is a list that holds stuff. Uh, it's a list, so it holds stuff in, a, uh, in an ordered manner. And it does so using an array. Over here, this, uh, this holds, stuff in an ordered, uh, it holds stuff in an ordered manner using a bunch of linked nodes. A uh, array list holds stuff in an ordered manner using an array. Right? So it's more specific as you go down the hierarchy. And it's a way to, uh, to organize stuff because you do this all the time. Uh, so what's the uh, mnemonic device for domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus, species? Does anybody rem remember that? Okay, well, I have an inappropriate mnemonic device in the back of my head, and so, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, okay, go ahead. <laughs> an appropriate one, please. King Philip came over from Great Spain. There you go. King Philip came over from Great Spain. Uh, and why do we why do we have that kind of hierarchy in biology? It's to organize things. Right? Reptiles go over here, and reptiles are completely distinct from mammals. Mammals go over here. But then within one of those organizations, then you've got 
you know, uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you've got birds, and, uh, and then you, they're not mammals, are they? No, they're not mammals. So somewhere else over here, you've got birds, uh, and, uh, you know, you organize things in the, this tree-like data, this tree-like fashion, because it allows you to make generalizations that, well, all animals are living things. Some animals, however, lay eggs, and some animals uh, don't lay eggs. Uh, some, some animals are single-celled, and they're over here, or whatever, right? It's a way to organize things, and then within one of those, that we've got mammals. Well, some mammals do uh, have uh, this phenotypes, and some animals have th these phenotypes, etc. Uh, so it's a way to organize stuff uh, in a very, very complex... Uh, uh, it's a way of bringing order and organization to a very complex idea, right? Uh, and that's what a hierarchy does for you. Uh, that you can organize it and, uh, and, and potentially everything below it has some sort of an, an inheritance um, kind of uh, functionality, right? So it's a way of organizing code. It's a way of reusing code. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is an example, right? What we're going to do, I've already started with a savings account. Right? And uh, as I warned today, uh, this has nothing to. This is my standard example that I go to. This has nothing to do with your project. It's a very, very similar design ideas behind it, but it, uh, this is not necessarily an, uh, an account from your project. Okay, what is a savings account? The way that I've de uh, defined it here, and the way that I've designed it, is that every, it has an account ID, which is a string, potentially because you want some dashes in it. Maybe uh, an account number is AA four four two or something like that. And so it might have some alphanumeric characters. I've got an owner, which is another person. If I go to person, it has a first name, last name, social security number, uh, the date of birth, which is a local date, and an address. Well, an address is a city, state, uh, uh, a street, city, state, and zip. Okay. Do you remember what we called this kind of chain uh, that uh, a person owns an address object? A, uh, a savings account owns a person object. That ownership is composition, right? An object is composed of another object. That's not necessarily anything to do with uh, object-oriented programming, uh, but it is something that we'll come back to later on because it's kind of a, a, a composition is kind of an, an alternative to inheritance, which is what we're going to do now. Well, this is great, uh, but uh, now I want to also support, say, what kind of what other kind of accounts are there? Savings account and then a checking account. Okay, so copy. Pasta checking account. Right. And there's now my checking account. Well, how is a checking account different? First of all, we'll assume, like I did this morning, that it's a Wells Fargo account and you don't actually earn any interest on your checking accounts. Now, a lot of checking accounts you can earn interest. It's, it might as well be zero, though. Uh, but, no, uh, but also, it's a terrible checking account because you have an annual fee. Right. Right? Some checking accounts have an annual fee. Uh, maybe it's also a line of credit or something like that where you actually take out a loan. That's another type of account. Other types of accounts might be certificates of deposit accounts, money market accounts, a line of credit accounts, credit card accounts, etc. So there might be a whole lot of different consumer accounts, bank accounts, that I want to define. But now, uh, now that I got rid of the APR, by the way, I can no longer have this, right? that it doesn't pay me any money. Uh, let's go back to the savings account and look and see what that looked like. Uh, your annual earnings on a savings account, you take the balance and you multiply it by the annual percentage yield. The annual percentage yield is simply just the annual percentage rate divided by 12 because you are it compounds 12 each month, 12 months in a year. Uh, and then you raise that power to 1 plus the, uh, uh, the APR and then raise that to the, your terms, the number of terms here is 12, 12, 12 months in a year, subtract one, and then you multiply that balance by the balance. So if you have a, an account with $100 in it, and this is a 1%, a 1.2% uh, count, uh, then you earn a buck 20 plus a little bit because of compounding out of that. Right? So you earn a buck 20 a year plus a little bit of the compounding, okay? Uh, that's just your little financial lesson for the day, right? Uh, there, there are many different ways to, uh, uh, to, 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 to compute interest, and that's, this is just one of them, okay? So I'll, I'll go ahead and get rid of that in the checking account and get rid of the APR in the checking account. Uh, and why are you still not compiling? Oh, then APR, okay, I'll get rid of that too. Uh, but we do need to take in the annual fee. And so 
this dot annual fee is equal to that annual fee. So good idea how I just designed this. Uh, now we need a money market account. Copy, paste, change a little thing, a few little things. Now we need a certificate of deposit account that only does quarterly instead. So cut, paste, change a little bit. Uh, now we need a, uh, a Christmas account. And so cut, paste, change it a little bit again. Should I continue this? No. Let's take a look and compare these two classes that I just created. Here's another little IDE trick. Uh, it, it's off the screen now, but if you go down to compare with each other, then you get this nice little thing where it's a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, you can do this with git as well, git diff. Uh, it doesn't even have to be in your repo. It can be any file on any system. And you can see that there's no difference here between these three things. Likewise, it's very, very similar um, constructor. Uh, all the getters are the same. The two string method is the same. Right? So you see a lot of repeated code here. The solution is to take that repeated code, take those commonalities, and promote them up to some sort of a super class. If we go back to this example, there are some commonalities with a set and a list. For example, you can put stuff into a set, you can put stuff into a list. So each one of them has an add method. Well, if I've got that, rep, re, that repeated functionality of an add method here and an add method here, let's go ahead and promote those up so that every collection has an add method. Right? You can do this with state and behavior at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create yet another, bank, uh, yet another uh, account type. And I'll go ahead and cut, paste. What should I call it if it's a generic account? I could just call it account. I'll go ahead and go with bank account, though. Right. There we go. And let's open that. And let's identify everything that's in common with both a checking account and a savings account. That's going to be with that diff that we did, that side-by-side -side comparison. It's going to be an account ID, an owner, and a balance. But, not, uh, but what about annual fee? No, annual fee was only in the checking account, right? So let's go ahead and get rid of that. Get rid of that and get rid of the annual fee here. And it's just an account ID, an owner, and a balance. Right? Every account has a, a balance. Right? If, if, you don't, if you have, is there anything, uh, is there a bank account without a balance? I guess you could have, well, technically I guess you could have, what, what do they call it? The, you go down to the vault and deposit, deposit box, safety deposit box, there we go. Uh, that might be an account, I don't know. Uh, but uh, everything's going to have a balance. Uh, for now, everything has a balance. Okay, Everything has an owner. Everything is going to have an account ID, which is a string. Right? Uh, all of their accounts are going to. And everything has need of printing out to the standard output or some way of representing it. Uh, and so the way that we've done that is just simply the account ID and then concatenated with the dollar sign and then the actual balance of this account. And you can get more fancy there if you want. Right? Now, a checking account if it's a subclass of a bank account, we don't have to repeat this stuff. Right? The way that you make do subclassing is, like I said, that you can extend the functionality of a superclass to a uh, from a superclass to a subclass. We use in Java the extends keyword. Now you have to tell it what you are extending, what you are subclassing, and in this case, we are subclassing the bank account. Right? Now automatically. Account ID, all this stuff is included. Account ID, uh, owner, and get balance, those are all automatically included because of inheritance. Uh, if you've got a subclass up here, the super, or a, super, sub, a super class up here, subclass down here, it inherits everything from its parent. Right? Uh, so we don't need uh, those three the things, the, the, the account ID, the balance, and the, uh, the owner. We also don't need the two string method. We inherit behavior and state. Uh, everything that's defined in this bank account, all the getters, the two string method, and all this state right here is inherited by the checking account. Now, what we need to do is we need to make sure that if we're constructing a subclass, that we also construct its superclass. Do you remember when we did constructors, if I wanted one constructor to call another constructor, what key did, word did I use? This. Now, if I want a constructor in a subclass to call the superclasses constructor, 
what keyword do you think I use? Not this, but that, well, that, <laughs> but that is super, right? It's, it's above me, so super, right? And I pass in account ID, oops, ID and balance. Now, if, I'm, if I have uh, other state that's in the subclass that's not in the superclass, of course, I also need to initialize that, and I do that here with the annual fee, okay? Uh, great, uh, and I don't need this anymore. Uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing with savings account. Right? Now, savings account, oops, uh, not that one, this savings account, right? Uh, with that one, okay, I'll go ahead and get rid of the, uh, the, 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 the repeated stuff and extends bank account. Right? And I only have the APR here. Uh, account ID and balance will be passed up to the super constructor. And I don't need to take care of those here. I just need to take care of the APR. Likewise, the getters are all taken care of in the super class. Uh, and, uh, and as well as the two-string method. We still have a problem here, though, that we'll talk about here in a second. So I've got a bank account, which defines everything that every bank account has, so that when you extend from it, you inherit all that stuff. You inherit the state, you inherit all these getters, and this two-string method. Let's go ahead, oh, I would, uh, to be able to use this as a demonstration, we, still have, we first have to resolve this. This dot balance. Do you see a balance anywhere here with the savings account? No. But does the savings account have a balance? Savings, I mean, conceptually it does, of course. Right? Even if it's zero. <laughs> or negative if you're overdrawn. Right? There, is a sa there is a balance. There's a concept of a balance here, right? All you have to do is go to the super class, and now do you see the balance? Right? But tell me about the visibility of balance. It's private. Private means that only the class can see it. Only bank account can see balance. So down here in the get saving or in the, the savings account, to get this account's balance, what do I need to do? Get balance. I'm controlling things through encapsulation using a getter. Right? That's one solution. Another solution, let me go ahead and back this up. Another solution is to change the visibility. This is not necessarily uh, breaking encapsulation, but another keyword that we can use is, well, that's another keyword that we know of, public. Is that a good idea? That is breaking encapsulation. That's making it public uh, and it's no longer controllable. Uh, somebody can set that equal to whatever they want. Uh, and if any, any piece of your code can change that, then you need to test for the eventuality that some piece of your code will change that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through to somewhere in between. Protected, exactly. Protected means that not only can the, can the class see it, that's always going to be the case, private, public, protected, whatever, but now the subclasses can also see it. So now over here in savings account where I was using this before and this was a, a compiler error that it was not visible, now that's been resolved. Right? So if the subclasses need to see it, you either need to get, give them permission to do so through a getter or you need to ensure that it's protected, opening up a little bit of that visibility for the subclasses, okay? All right, so to review really quick here, what we've seen so far, in Java, you can create subclasses using the extends, and it is an S, uh, it's, a, it's a verb form, right? Extends keyword, all right? Uh, if class a extends class B, then A is a subclass, B is a superclass, right? or a parent class, or a der derived class, or no, the subclass is a derived class and derivee, I'm not sure, I forget that, but subclass is also called a child class. Right? You have this parent-child relationship. Just like over here, uh, these are the parents and then uh, the, these are the uh, uh, um, children, and then these are the grandchildren, right? So uh, it's also transitive. An array list is a list, but it's also, and a list is a collection. Therefore, by transitivity, an array list is a collection. You have this inheritance all the way down, okay? The protected keyword, the, the protected keyword, 
can be used to make variables visible to subclasses. Right? Remember that private uh, means only the class can see it. And of course, stay away from public variables unless they are uh, final variables, and, and which makes them constants. All, right? uh, all, all methods, public, private, protected, it doesn't matter, and state, public, private, protected, it doesn't matter, are inherited by the subclass. And I say it doesn't matter because private, public, protected, those only deal with, with uh, visibility. You still inherit it in the subclass even if it's not visible, just like we saw with the balance. You still inherited the balance, you inherited the get balance getter, all of that was inherited in the subclass uh, even though you couldn't necessarily see it. If it's private, it just means that you can't see it. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, and inheritance, inheritance defines an is a is a relationship, right? That a uh, savings account is a bank account. And uh, what was the other one? Checking account is a bank account. What about the inverse question? What about the other way around? Is a bank account a savings account? Good answer. Not necessarily. Right. This is called contravariance. Right. Question. Is a savings account a checking account? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is called an invariance. Right. Now to understand this, I'm going to go to another diagram here that we'll come back to at the end. Uh, so a, a bird is a general kind of concept of an animal, right? Uh, is there actually just a bird bird? No, give me an example of a bird other than these two. Chicken, Chicken all right. So uh, a, 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 is a chicken a bird? Yes. Is a bird necessarily a chicken? No. All right. Uh, anybody, uh, does anybody know what a capon is? A, a capon? Capon? I don't know how to pronounce it. C-A-P-O-N? It's also a chicken. Well, it's a rooster uh, that I think that has been chemically castrated and then force, potentially force-fed like duck is force-fed to make a, a foie gras. Foie gras, all right? So, which is illegal <laughs> now. Uh, in the United States, I don't know if it's totally illegal, but in the European Union, it definitely is, I think. And for good reason, because you force feed ducks so that their liver uh, gets engorged and it's a delicacy. It's, it's, it's disgusting. Another disgusting one would be, has anybody ever heard of ortolan? Right, it's, a, uh, it's a bird that you eat alive, I think. Right? Yeah, it's a little tiny bird. That you, they, it's a delicacy. You eat it alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very gross. Right? <laughs> but anyway, those are all types of birds. They're specific types of birds, though, right? There's no concept of a general generic bird. There is a robin, sure, and there's an ostrich. Is a robin a bird? Absolutely. So treating a robin as a generic bird, that's okay because that's called covariance. Because it follows that is a relationship. Superclass, subclass. Uh, is a bird necessarily an ostrich? Are all birds ostriches? No. That's called a contravariant. In other words, this bird might be an ostrich, in what, and so forcing it to become an ostrich and treating it like an ostrich is okay, but it may not necessarily be okay if in what you have in your hand is a bird or an ortolan. Right? You force it to become an ostrich, it's not necessarily going to work. In fact, if you know that you have a robin, can you force it to become an ostrich? Not through some inventive, not unless you have some genetic engineering machine of some sort. Uh, but you, <laughs> that's called an invariant relationship. Right? That's never safe. Sometimes contravariance is safe, if you happen to get lucky. Sometimes, uh, always, covariance is safe, but never is invariance safe. Right? You can't treat one, uh, uh, one thing like another. Right? And 
that is uh, the concept of the, that's the concept that, that goes along with the concept of inheritance. A subclass can always be treated as its superclass, or its super superclass, or its super super superclass, however deep you want to go. This is called co uh, covariance, right? a covariant relationship. A subclass, or a superclass, may be treated as its subclass, but it is not a very good idea. Right? It's not a very good idea to treat a bird as an ostrich unless you know that it's an ostrich. And again, this is contravariance. And then finally, uh, a class may never be treated as its sibling or cousin. Right? This is invariance, an invariant relationship. Okay. Uh, and it's never okay because you can't force an ostrich to become a bird. In the context of our example here, you cannot force a savings account to become a checking account because they have completely different state. You can allow a, a savings account to be treated as a regular old bank account. Right? Well, let's do that. Over here, I've got three savings accounts. Let's go ahead and create another. Uh, and, and you can see that it inherits that two string method. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Uh, that uh, ABC, one, two, three, X, Y, Z. These are the uh, these are the things I set up here: hundred dollars, fifty dollars, and fifteen hundred dollars. You can also create a checking account. C is equal to new checking account. Checking account. And I forget what we need there. Uh, um, who uh, a balance? Uh, I have a hundred dollars in my checking account. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much money I have. Uh, and then uh, we can make this into a Steam wallet instead. And I know how, how exactly how much I have in my Steam wallet. Uh, Fifty-seven dollars and eighteen cents. Uh, let's see what else. What else do I need for a checking account? Oh, an annual fee. A twenty-five dollar annual fee. There we go. So. What I can do, I can do a, co a covariance kind of thing. What I can do is I can do a bank account, B, and I can treat my checking account as a bank account. This is always going to be okay, right? This is a, co uh, this is a covariance, uh, co coercion, right? In other words, it's, it's an upcasting, right? I am treating a subclass as its superclass. This is likely not to be okay, but it's still okay in the co following context. If I've got a, uh, a checking account, and I'll force, uh, and I'll go at C2 here, and I'll force that bank account to become a checking account again, uh, B. There we go. So it's not going to let me do this by itself. And the reason that it's not going to let me do this by itself is because of it's Java. It's, it's Java is not going to let you do this. Now, to understand what's going on here, why that's a, a syntax error, Think about integers and doubles. Right? Now, there's not necessarily an is a relationship there, but can you treat an integer like a double? Can you change 2 into 2.0? Yeah, there's no, there's no loss of information there. But can you change, treat a double like an integer? Can you take 3.5 and force it to become an integer? Well, you can, in a sense, by doing what? Well, truncation and forcing it to become a how? by typecasting it, right? And then truncation occurs and 3.5 becomes three, right? So you can force one type to become another type, but only if you do that explicit typecasting. Yes, for the purposes of this division, I want to treat this integer as a double so that I don't lose that precision, right? So how could I do the same thing here? I have a checking account. I can force that generic bank account to become a Checking account. Right. Likely not to be okay though. In this case, it's okay because I see two uh, system.out.println c2. We can see that this is still going to be, let's say, see, I casted the checking account, which has, let's, let's give it a, something different, $175, so that we know that we're actually printing that out correctly. And don't worry about that. There, foo, $175. And it was perfectly happy to do this explicit typecasting. Right. Uh, again, this is not a great option, but this is a contravariance. Right. Let's take a look at a contravariance that's not going to work. 
let me go ahead and take uh, the bank. I still have bank account B here. What if I tried to force that to become a savings account? Savings account uh, S is equal to, uh, I'll force it, savings account through a typecast. I'll force that bank account B to become a savings account. Now, is this going to work? Is Let's trace back here. What is B? B is set up here to C. What is C? C is a checking account. Can you force a checking account to become a savings account? Nope, that's that invariant relationship, right? Invariant. What's going to happen in Java? What do you think? It won't let me, but it will only know at runtime. And it manifests itself at runtime how? A class cast exception. This is an invariant relationship. A checking account cannot be casted to a savings account because of the inheritance hierarchy. They're siblings. That's an invariant, and you can't do that. Yeah? Good question, because it's a uh, bank account could be anything. At that. So this is simple enough that uh, you could write the compiler to check all your local stuff. But if I had a method that took a bank account, you could call that method with a savings account. You could call that method with a checking account. You could call it with whatever account you want, as long as it was a bank account. There's no way at run at compile time to tell what did you pass me. You just passed me a bank account. Right? That's all I know of inside the method. Now, there are ways that you can do some static analysis to do a full program trace, but uh, there, there, there's no 100% sure way of telling that. Oh, eh, not if you use reflection or anything like that, All right? So again, if you have some uh, some heavy static analysis tools, yeah, you can do a full trace. And now your com compilation time is going to skyrocket because it's tracing every single possible path. And did you ever pass a, a savings account into this thing uh, or not? Right? Uh, there's no really no way to check that at compile time reliably. Without, without investing in those static analysis tools. OK, so this is invariant. This will lead to a class cast exception. So don't do that. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that so we, don't have, we at least don't have this uh, uh, problem anymore. OK? All right, let's go back to this a little bit here. And before I asked you, is there a concept of a generic bird? What did you answer? I mean, there's a concept of it. They, they, there's this this uh, kingdom, phylum, I don't know what, of birds and a bunch of things in that. Is, is it a kingdom or phylum, I don't, order, genus, whatever? Uh, we've got all these bird, this class of birds, right? And so there there are some things that we can gener generalize about them. They all have wings. Uh, they all have feathers. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but uh, they all lay eggs, right? So there are some things that we can generalize about them and put into this upper bird class here. Can you ever create a bird bird? Right? So you can, in the, real, in the real world, you can have a robin, you can have an ostrich, you can have a penguin, whatever, but can you have a bird bird, like a real one? <laughs> exactly, it doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it, this all goes, to, uh, if you've ever read Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Right? That's that standard reading in high schools now, or right? No, okay. It all goes to Plato's theory of forms, uh, and so the programming languages have philosophical basis in philosophic uh, philosophy. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah. All right. So let's review Plato's theory of forms uh, with just an example. So we're not able, we're going to talk about Plato using the Socratic method here. Uh, what uh, is there such thing as a uh, a circle? Yeah, is there? This is philosophy now. It's the Socratic method. Is there a circ Is there such thing as a circle? Is this a circle? No. All right. Now assume that I am good. I'm much better at drawing circles than I am, and the, uh, the obvious imperfections here are gone. Would that still be a circle? If I had a, a robot come up and make a perfect circle, would that be a perfect circle? No. Why? You zoom in on it, and is this a circle? No, it's a collection of, of, of ink smudges. Right? 
Exactly. It's an abstraction. It's a, it's a mathematical abstraction that doesn't actually exist in the real world. Even if you had a perfect computer draw a circle on the string uh, on the screen, what would it look? What would it actually be? A bunch of pixels, an approximation of a circle. There is a mathematical ideal of what a circle is. Plato takes this a step further and says there is an ideal of what a chair is. That's an instance of a chair. That's an instance of a chair. That's an instance of a chair. But there's an ideal of a chair. That's the theory of forms, right? Uh, and it's the, it goes to the allegory of the cave because what do we see in the real world? Just shadows and the, rea and the, the mathematical ideals are behind us casting a shadow into the real world, right? These are the shadows casting and this is the ideal up here, right? That's, what you, that, that's how you can conceive of this thing. That that's a blueprint and that's where we get those, the, a, a robin, that's where we get an ostrich. There immediately comes a problem here when you actually start looking at code. Bank account, account B is equal to new bank account. Uh, did I already use B? Okay, B2, hmm, B2, there we go. All right, and uh, oops, do we have, no, have a constructor over here? Uh, oh, it needs an account ID and a balance, there we go. Uh, account ID is, huh, and zero, point zero. All right, uh, come on, let's not instantiate, uh, yeah, you can, it's right there. Oh, okay, that's the wrong bank account. Import, uh, get rid of all of these, and import, nope, wrong one. We're in the honors section right there. And I'm just going to do very bad practice, but I'm going to just put, to save some time. I'm going to do that. I didn't do that. All right. All right. Don't use wild cards in your imports. All right. So now I've got a bank account. And now it's happy about this because it can create a bank account. Does there exist a bank account, though, the way that I've designed this? Does there exist a bird? Should you be able to create a generic bird in real life? No. The, the, that's where we get the idea, the ideal, plat uh, the platonic ideal. That's where we get that as well, right? Uh, so should should I be able to do this in my code when I've got a savings account? All accounts are either savings accounts or they're checking accounts. Is there such a thing as a generic bank account? I don't see the use of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that you can't do something like that. Uh, we called a circle a what? A mathematical abstraction. I'm going to make this into a class, a class abstraction. Right? Class, I was about to say classic abstraction, but no. A class abstraction. I'm going to make this an abstract class. Now it's an abstract idea that prevents you from creating instances of it. Now this is a compiler error, and the compiler says you cannot instantiate the type bank account because it's abstract. You can't actually have a bank account. You can, all, you can have checking accounts because it's not abstract. It's concrete. You can have a, uh, a savings account because it's a concrete. You can treat a checking account or like a bank account, right? But you can't create a generic bank account because I don't know what to do with that, right? It's neither giving me interest and it's neither costing me annual fees. So what is it doing, right? Uh, and if you have something like that, where you don't want to, uh, anybody to uh, be able to create something like that, then you make it abstract. Going back to this, collections are abstract. You cannot create a collection because it, it just holds stuff. How does it hold stuff? How would I put stuff in? How, uh, well, you call this add method. Okay. Well, beyond that, internally to the class, how does it work? I don't know. It's abstract. You can't create a collection. You can't even create a set because how does a set work? Well, this implementation here uses a hash table. This implementation over here uses a tree data structure. How does a list work? Or how does a list hold stuff? Well, this one holds it in an array, and this one holds it in a linked list, a bunch of nodes. But everything above this is abstract. You can't create a generic set because you actually need an implementation. You need the details to actually get it to work. Right? And that's the idea behind abstraction. You can create an abstract class where you are prevented from creating it because 
you ask questions, does this cost me money or does this give me money? Does this earn me money? And if you don't have the answer to that because it's just a generic bank account, make it abstract. Right? So the abstract keyword uh, in Java, the abstract keyword can be used in a class to make the class abstract meaning you cannot instantiate instances of the class. Right? Uh, useful if, uh, you, uh, if you design your class uh, such that the uh, superclass is incomplete, right? uh, that you wouldn't know how to use, actually use it in your program. How would I actually use a bank account? Right? Uh, I don't know. Right? Um, furthermore, you can also um, uh, let's see, how else, do, how else did I want to do this? Sorry, let me look at my outline. Okay. Okay, yeah. Let's create one, uh, so I'll go ahead and get rid of this because it's abstract, you can no longer do this. Uh, let's take this a, a step further. And now that I've got an inheritance with three classes, you know, the bank account, checking account, savings account, let's create one more class. Let's create a... Uh, in the uh, over here, a uh, I don't know what kind of a, what what other kind of accounts are there? Money market accounts, certificate of account, uh, certificate of de deposit account. They could all be empty. <laughs> certificate of deposit account, uh, deposit zip account. There we go. So a CD account, right? Let's go ahead and go with that. What is a certificate of deposit account? Well, what does it have? It has an account ID, an owner, and probably a balance, right? We get that from extending a bank account. What else does a certificate of deposit account have that uh, just a regular old generic bank account may not have? It also has a, a, you earn money in a certificate of deposit account if you didn't know that. It also has an APR, so private double APR except for the way that you calculate the CDs typically is, is different. They do it quarterly instead of monthly. So let's go ahead and go over here to checking account and see that we've got get annual earnings. And once you've got the APR, right, the, the balance is inherited from the bank account up here, uh, then instead of every month, it's every quarter. And so we can change this to have a little bit more specific behavior. Just like the, uh, the, the, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, list and, and set, one has a little bit more specific behavior that it holds stuff in an unordered manner or an ordered manner. Then further, if you've got subclasses there, a little bit more specific behavior. One holds them in a, uh, an array, another holds them in a bunch of nodes. Here, we've got a certificate of deposit which slightly changes the behavior of other things. Right? And uh, by computing your uh, interest, compounding your interest quarterly instead. Now, still complaining about here because we need a constructor. I'll just go ahead and auto-generate it. This dot APR is equal to APR. There we go. And that needs to be passed in, double APR. There we go. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. How did I want to go on this? Yep. All right. So we've got checking accounts. We've got certificate of deposit accounts and savings accounts. Two of these things earn us interest. So what I can do over here in the demonstration is I can ask how much am I earning from that savings account? So the first savings account we have was S1, system.out.println, s1.getAnnual earnings, uh, system.out.println, uh, and I need to create one, so cd1.getAnnual earnings. I'm gonna have to create that though. So uh, I don't wanna type all that. Certificate of deposit. It's looking like a Microsoft or a, a iOS programming with so many words in it. Certificate of deposit account CD1 is equal to new. Certificate of deposit account um, bar uh, $1,000 and 5% interest. Right, there we go. And let's print those both out. Yeah, yeah. So I'm earning $1.20 and then a hey penny there. Uh, and, uh, and then my CD account, I'm earning 
uh, $50 and 94 cents and also a hay penny there. Of course, you can go in and change your you change this so that it rounds to the next nearest cent or something like that, all right? All right. What if I wanted to treat all of these things as one? What if I wanted to put them all in a list because I've got three or four different accounts and I want to treat them all the same? I want to sum up how much I'm going to earn this year. Right? So a list of bank accounts. My accounts is equal to new array list. There we go. And we'll go ahead and import these things from Java utils, Java utils. And all of these are my accounts. So my account dot add uh, S1, my account of my, oh, that's my savings account, uh, my CD account here, my accounts, sorry. And also, you know, I do have a checking account. It's up there. Checking account C2. There we go. Now let's go ahead and get my total, right? My total annual earnings. Right? Uh, total annual earnings. I'll start it out at zero. And then for each bank account in my list of bank accounts, I'll go with A in my accounts, I want to go total annual earnings plus equals uh, the account dot get annual earnings here. There we go. And then you can print out the total system dot. Uh, out.println total copy paste. I'll just do it on one line here. It's not going to be pretty, but there we go. What's the problem? Let me increase the size here and you can see. Get annual earnings. So what is it saying? Is undefined for the type bank account. Where is get annual earnings defined? In one of the, in not just one of the subclasses, and how many of the subclasses? Certificate of deposit, you get annual earnings based quarterly. Uh, over here in savings account, you get annual earnings, but based monthly, compounded monthly. Uh, what about uh, checking account? Do you get annual earnings here? No. So some things I can treat as their, uh, if I treat everything as its superclass, I kind of lose the ability to write one size fits all code. So one thing I would one one way that I could go is just okay keep a list of all of my savings accounts keep a list of all my CD accounts keep a list of all my checking accounts does that sound good and then sum up all the the total earnings of savings accounts sum up all the save uh, the earnings of the CD accounts and then ignore the checking accounts because I know that those are all zero right now add a money market account now add a Christmas account. Now add 50 other types of accounts. Right? You're gonna have to treat them all differently. And if you're treating them all differently, you're not taking advantage of inheritance. Right? I wanna treat them all as generic bank accounts for the purposes of uh, summing up all my total earnings. Right? So what I'm going to do as my first solution here is I'm gonna go back to the drawing board here and say that, all right, fine, there is going to be a public get annual earnings method. I don't know how it works for a generic bank account. But now over here in certificate of deposit, we already have this uh, implementation. It's, uh, it's, it's balanced and then it's compounded quarterly. Uh, over here in savings account, we've got this balance and it's compounded uh, monthly. Over here in checking account, is there a concept of annual earnings? I mean, we can make the concept, get annual earnings. What are your annual earnings for a savings or a base checking account though? Okay, we could return zero. Another answer would be annual fee. Is that, does that pay you? No, it costs you. So if you've got $25 annual fee, your annual earnings could be negative 25. That's another way. But I, I like the first idea, uh, zero, okay? There is no annual earnings because this checking account does not pay you. It, you pay it, right? Okay, now come back up here to bank account though. Uh, what do we do here? First answer might be the default, just like with uh, checking accounts. Return zero. Right? Now the advantage to this is I've got some default behavior. 
if I create a, a line of credit account, right, that doesn't pay me, I pay, it's like I can take out an instant loan basically, uh, and then pay interest on that loan, pay it back, so the balance get back, gets back to zero, and uh, there's an annual fee or whatever, but it's never gonna pay me, it's always gonna be uh, zero. Right? Or I could go another way. I don't know, so I'm not going to try. Right? I don't know how to implement this, so I'm not going to give it a method body. Uh, well, if I don't know, how, you know, if the concept of earning uh, annual uh, earnings or annual interest is abstract, then I can make the method abstract. Uh, abstract. Yeah, there we go. And now I don't have to provide a body to my method. Uh, now it's just that a bank account has this method that returns a double, and it's called get annual earnings. Any subclass that implements, or that, uh, not implements, any subclass that extends this uh, superclass will have to provide the actual implementation of this abstract method. Right? So, for example, over here in savings account, we implement it by compounding monthly. In certificate of deposit, we, uh, we, we do it by compounding quarterly. Over here in checking account, we implement it by simply returning zero. These are all overriding methods. In the subclass, you change the behavior inherited from the sub superclass. In this case, we didn't inherit anything. We just inherited the signature of the method. Right? This is the signature only, not the actual behavior, not the implementation. Just that to be a bank account, you have to have this method called get annual earnings. Right? And that's only possible if you've got an abstract class. Because if you don't have an abstract class, you can't have an abstract method. But if you have an abstract class, then you might have abstract methods or might or or not. Right? There. Okay. Okay. Questions so far? No, oh, yeah. Mm. Yes. Here because I don't in bank account what's what is that method? I have no idea, right? Yeah, and so th th this this error did go away when I uh, when I put that abstract method up there, right? Now every bank account is guaranteed to have this minimum interface where you have this function here. I don't know what it does. I don't care because that's the object's responsibility. Uh, a checking account is supposed to tell you how this works. A certificate of deposit account is supposed to take care of how this works. Okay. And then finally, you can have a pure abstract interface. It's a pure abstract class, new interface. I don't know. Uh, is own, uh, owned? Owner owned? There we go. I'll just do it like this. So something is owned if it has an owner and you can, has a getter to get an owner. So public uh, person get owner. All right, there we go. Do you see any state? Do you see any actual implementations in this thing? Do you see any code? I mean, there is code, but do you see like uh, an actual method code? No, this is pure abstraction. Right? Uh, over here with the bank account, it's partial abstraction because there is an actual, uh, you know, there's a, a method called get owner. Uh, there is uh, there is actual state here, so it's concrete. It's not purely abstract. An interface is a pure abstraction. Now, the purity was broken in, in Java 8, I think, where they added uh, these things called default methods. I don't know why. Uh, don't uh, oh, I'm not going to cover them, but they did add default methods in Java 7 or 8 or something like that. I forget which, uh, but it kind, of, it kind of violated the purity of, uh, of, of the abstraction, of pure abstract uh, interfaces. Right. How would you uh, use an interface? Well... A checking account has a get owner method, right? It's inherited from the bank account. A bank account, we can say that that implements a, an owner, or has owner, yeah, owned, sorry, owned. Right. So by saying that you implement an interface, it means that you are guaranteeing that any uh, non-abstract subclass of this class is going to provide that method somehow. Uh, and that's a way that you can, and I'll, I'll show you, uh, in fact, yeah, I'll show it to you now. Here's a more complex view of the collections library. So there's the collections library. Here's the actual view. 
right? This is, the, this is um, a full inheritance hierarchy here. Uh, up here we've got pure abstraction, all, just interfaces. These are the methods that these things need to provide. Then we've got abstract classes sitting in between, which are, some of these uh, methods might be abstract, but other methods are actually implemented. For example, iterating over elements. That's the same whether or not you've got a set or a list. Uh, that uh, you just iterate of the first one, the second one, the third one. There is that concept down here with the, the set, but it's just not apparent to the outside world. And then you've got the actual uh, non-abstract classes. The tree set, the hash set, the array list, and the linked list. So it provides basically a hierarchy of abstraction all the way up. The most pure abstraction, and then down here this is complete concrete. We don't call them concrete, but that's the antonym of abstract, so that's what I use. Right? And these are all interfaces. Navigatable set, sorted set, serializable, random access, deck, queue, clonable. Right? Uh, the, 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 the re one of the use cases of using an interface is that it doesn't lock you into this hierarchy. This hierarchy right here is locked. Right? The, uh, the, this follows an is a relationship, and you can't get out of this hierarchy. That a tree set is an abstract set, an abstract set is an abstract collection, and it implements all these interfaces. You can uh, take an interface and you can put it wherever you want. For example, only a tree set is na uh, navigatable. If I said that uh, an abstract collection is navigatable set, that would mean that everything here would have to be an, uh, 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 navigatable. Right? Sorted set, right? the tree set is sorted, the hash set is not. So this is kind of a way of, what did I say a set was? A set was a collection that held stuff in an unordered manner. That's not necessarily true. If it's a sorted set, it is ordered, and, uh, and it maintains an ordering. Yeah? So what if instead of holding common properties and then each dependable class is a matching? What if instead of one concrete class that has the common methods in the abstract set and other classes do, and the other classes That would be composition, or an, a, an even, a related concept that you probably actually want to think about is called a mix-in. So you all like going to uh, uh, ice cream stores. What, what is that ice cream store? Cold Stone, thank you. So everybody likes going to Cold Stone, right? So you get ice cream, what else can you get? Sprinkles. Sprinkles, okay, what else? M&Ms, &Ms, okay. Come on, Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups are a mix-in. All those other things are mix-ins too. What do they do them with them? They they mix them in, right? So one way of creating objects is I've got this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. Uh, I only want this thing and this thing though. So I will mix them in to my object, and now they they belong to my object. It's it's part of a uh, it's like a JavaScript object-oriented programming where. Uh, you end up not having classes or a strict inheritance. Instead, you have prototypical inheritance that you want this thing to have that thing. Okay, just put mix it in and, and you're good to go. Now it's that thing. Uh, the way that typing works there is duct typing, though. Uh, so this is not necessarily a bank account. This is not necessarily a savings account. If I put in a balance, it becomes a bank account. If I put in a, uh, an APR, now it becomes a savings account. You, you can't do that in Java, no. Oh. This is JavaScript, uh, and, and duck typing. Uh, in Python, too, you can do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, some people do. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's called duck typing. Why? If I've got an object, and I give it a, wa a waddle method, and I give it a quack method, what does it look like now? Yeah, why? It, no, no, it doesn't float. It, it walks like a duck. It talks like a duck. Therefore, it's a duck. Right? So that's how duck typing works. Right? Uh, and we don't have that in Java. That, that is in other mostly dynamic programming languages that have the concept of, uh, of inheritance. Right? So this is uh, a, a, a interfaces, abstraction, and then down here, concrete classes. Okay. Yeah. So when you're like declaring classes, can't you do a thing where it's like you bank account B equals new, but instead of bank account, you're like checking account. And yes, 
In fact, that's what we should do. Did I not do that? Uh, uh, or like, like I did here. Let, let's take this example right here. I treated it as its super class uh, because I still wanted to be able to, I could have done this. I, I wasn't using the fact that this was actually a list. I could have just called it a generic collection because all I did with it was iterate over it and every collection you can iterate over. Uh, that's going a little bit far because maybe I do want to sort it and pass it off to collections.sort. Right. So how does this all work? It works through something called dynamic dispatch using virtual tables. And we don't have enough time to go over it in detail, but uh, I, uh, I want to see if this kills here or not because I, I thought it would kill in the other, uh, other class. So uh, that bird example where I've got an ostrich and a robin. Right? So if I create a Charlie, who is a new robin, and Sweet B, who is an ostrich, and I've got this move method, well, an ostrich does what? Uh, I think I said walking, right? And a robin does flying, right? So how does this actually work? These are virtual tables. Both of these have a move method, but does it refer to flying or does it refer to walking? That's stored in the virtual table when this thing is created. So that even if I'm treating it as a bird and I call a move method, right, that means it, uh, uh, this should have been up here, but it looks at its move method and sees, oh, okay, well, it's a reference to this thing. I will dispatch the signal and actually call this function over here that prints walking. Right. All right, didn't kill hair either. All right. Nobody watches It's Always Sunny? What? Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Oh, that's a great show. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Charlie is the, the lawyer that specializes in bird law. Uh, B, B, B is always, they are always calling her an ostrich, right? So, oh, okay. Fine. 